obviously I don't have any uh, rehearsed or well, well prepared speech, so I'm just going to speak from the heart. So, as many of you may know, for the last few weeks, we've been covering the trial of Wisconsin versus Daryl Brooks. If you don't remember, Daryl Brooks is the individual that was accused of driving a red Ford Escape through the Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Now, he went to trial about three weeks ago, charged with 76 counts, six of which were intentional homicide. To those of you new to the channel, I'm a lawyer practicing domestic relations litigation. I'm a trial attorney, and I have been a trial attorney for more than 10 years. And I've got a friend, Spidey, from the channel of the Behavioral Arts, who specializes in body language. So during the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial, he and I collaborated on a video breaking down some of the testimony we saw in that case. And by popular demand, we found this trial in need of both of our analyses. So he and I, oddly enough, reached out to each other and decided that this would be a good one to collaborate on again. So as with the other video, this is going to be broken into two parts. Half of it is going to be on my channel and the other half on his. I'm going to place a link at the end of this video and I'm going to put a link in the description below for you to check out the content on his video. I honestly think you're not going to get a full view of our analysis unless you look at both. I hope you enjoy the content and without further ado, let's get rolling. Mr. Brooks, but then when I, I, have, I had wait, an wait. objection before. Well, here's the thing. You want to go off target and you want to bring up target. things from the past. I can't explain to you why sometimes the state has an objection and other times they don't. But when, they're not, when an objection has been made, it is my obligation to rule on it. I, and so there was an objection. I'm aware, I'm aware of that, Your Honor. But I'm also aware of the fact, and it's, it's clear, that I object quite often, and every single time I object is is just thrown to the side. Every single time. Well, I would disagree with that characterization, and, sir. And I make my rulings in this why case would you disagree based. With that? I'm like Can an you umpire. Point out one time? I'm like an umpire in a baseball game, sir. I call and see the legal objections as I see them. That is my role, and that is what I do. And are you kidding me? That's that's exactly you're what honored. I do. I'm an umpire, sir. You're I'm, I am a referee in this trial. If you're the um, uh, and let me finish. Okay. Let me finish, okay. Mr. Brooks. I, I okay? apologize. I'm late. So you finish. sometimes parties make objections. Sometimes they don't. There can be a variety of reasons. You make a lot of objections in this case. I, from my perspective, okay, you make a number of objections, I rule on them, and you disagree with them. But that doesn't mean I'm casting things aside. I'm making a call based on the rules of evidence. One of my roles is to be the umpire. Then you gotta right? be fair, Your Honor. You're a public I servant. Need, I am fair, and I'm no, gonna you're follow not. the you're rules not being of fair. evidence. Your Honor, that this is why I say that. unfettered questioning this is of why I witnesses say that. that are not relevant or that call for hearsay. Another classic grudge match. Uh, I think this trial should be, like the subtitle should be Brooks v. Judge Darrow. <laughs> and uh, this is another classic one. And I have so many questions for you once again, Rob. And two come to mind very much. The first is, this isn't the first time we're seeing her explain the law to him. To stop and say like, here's what the law is. And she takes a lot of time to explain to him like, here's how it works. Here's... And my question is, is that expected of her? Or can she just say, no, you don't get how this works, we're moving on. To what extent, when, a, when uh, a defendant decides to represent themselves, does the judge have to explain the law to this defendant? The second thing that I wanted to ask you is, are all objections born equal? <laughs> that last one hurt like my soul on the inside. Just because... <laughs> No, no, not a, not all objections are born equal. You know, <laughs> objection leading, what if any? That doesn't make it not leading. There are objections that are good. There are objections that are bad. So before I get to the complete meltdown that I'm going to have when I come to the objections, let me talk about what Judge Doro is doing here for a second. So Judge Doro has to walk a very, very, very fine line. She cannot be seen to be advising Mr. Brooks on the law. 
she is the judge. She is the arbiter of the law. She is the person that has the law presented to her, the facts presented to her, and she makes rulings on that. She has to explain her rulings, and she has to explain why the rulings are being made when there is an explanation required. Mr. Brooks doesn't understand this on a fundamental level and gets into back and forth. He likes to view them as debates, but the problem is, is that Judge Doro isn't the party with whom you are debating. She is the adjudicator. She's the judge. You don't get into a debate with a judge. The judge says something, and you maybe argue your point once, but then you drop it. Now, one thing I do like about her very, very, very much, she is very measured with her words. And I want you to watch this when she does her rulings. I want you to watch her cadence. I want you to watch her voice. I want you to watch when she's about to say something. You will see her physically take a moment and take a break, and she'll pull her hand back, or she'll shut her eyes for a moment, and then she'll reset because she's about to say something that is coming straight from brain to mouth without a filter. And she pauses and she goes, mm, I'm a judge. This is how it needs to be relayed. And she reorients the words to make a cogent legal argument for why she just made the ruling she did. I loved what she did there. Now, could she have done more in her courtroom? Attorneys are going to disagree on that. I think she did a good job with this particular defendant. Now, with regard to the objections, are all objections made equal? Short answer, no. You get to object to a ruling. You get to object to that ruling once. Then you can appeal it. Then you shut your mouth and you sit back down. He wants to object to everything. He wants to object to what's being said. He objects to the judge's ruling, the judge's characterization of the ruling. When he objects, the judge says, your objection is noted. He objects to that. He just objects. He's objectionable. That's what objectionable people are. I'm sorry. Mm, this man breaks my brain. Okay. Spidey, I did see one thing that I wanted to ask you a question about in all of this mess. <laughs> when he looks back at her, there's a brow furrow. And I'm okay at body language, but I could not understand what was going through his head. And I really wanted to get your input on that. Great. Uh, let's talk about that. But first, yeah, I, you know, I, I, love, I love what you said there. Um, and yeah, it's like, I think he confuses, I disagree and I object. Like yep. he doesn't get the difference. He thinks that anything that he disagrees with is, is a valid objection, but it's not. An objection is a list of things that, like there's a, there's a finite list of things, right? That you're allowed to object. He doesn't get that. He just thinks he can object anything he disagrees with. Yeah, there's, you right. can object to relevance. You can object to hearsay. You can object to out of court statements that are being brought in for a different purpose. You can object to documents not being authenticated. You can object to things, but there has to be a legal basis for the objection, not just I disagree. Exactly. I also do want to say this. I'm very careful with the word narcissist because unless it's diagnosed or a professional has taken a look at the person and said, I'm, I'm seeing signs of this, I don't like to throw the word around. So I'm not going to say that he is a narcissist, but he does have a lot of behaviors that are consistent with narcissism. Maybe not as a disorder, but as, as a trait. And one of them is... Um, the thought that you're being unfairly treated. We often see this in people with narcissistic tendencies. So I'm not talking about the disorder, I'm talking about more the behavior. Uh, to think that, oh, the, people are against me, this isn't fair, everyone's against me, and we're seeing this throughout the trial a lot. But let's talk about the eyebrows. Uh, and Rob, I'm so, again, I'm so glad you asked that because in my notes, it literally says, talk about the eyebrows up. This isn't the first time we see this, we see this a lot. As he's talking here in other moments, and what's interesting about it is very commonly, eyebrows go up as we say something and they come back down. He holds them up for extended periods of time, like this, and they go pretty high up. Um, eyebrows up typically, you know, body language is never absolute, but typically in a social setting, eyebrows going up means one of three things. One is surprise. If you say something and I'm surprised or shocked, eyebrows go up. The second is a display of innocence. So if I go like, I, I have nothing, like I tell you, I had nothing to do with this. It's the same way my hands go up to show you innocence, the eyes go up to show you intent. Because the eyes can tell us a lot about what someone's thinking. So when we go up with the eyes, go look, I have nothing to hide. This is also commonly associated with social approval or acceptance. So if you see someone you recognize, you go, hey, how are you? And it's to show good intent. So you're looking for that social approval. So innocent social approval all goes together. And finally, eyebrows up is with 
emphasis as well. So if I'm saying something to you and I really want to emphasize this, how important it is, these eyebrows go up. So in his case, I actually think it's all three a lot. I think his eyebrows are up to show I'm innocent here. I'm the, I'm innocent, I did nothing wrong. So, and they stay up to show that people who play victim often, these eyebrows go up because they're always like, I did nothing, I did nothing wrong. Everyone's blaming me. Uh, I also think he's doing it because he's constantly surprised by what's going on in this courtroom. He can't believe it. And finally, he really likes to emphasize his points. This is the reason that I think his eyebrows spend a lot of time up there because he's doing these three things a lot. And it's almost impossible for me to identify each one and go, oh, that's for this reason, that's for that reason. I just think he's constantly in a state of surprise, emphasis, and trying to display innocence. I have a question on that. Yeah. There's another thing about the eyebrows that always intrigued me. It's like an invitation. The eyebrows, when he throws them up, it's like an invitation, like, please throw it back to me. I would like to respond to what you're saying. And he does it a lot when she is talking, like there's an expectation when he raises the eyebrows and the forehead creases that, that she is going to throw it back to him for a response to what she just said. Is there any merit to that? I have no Absolutely. idea. I, I think very much. So when I said, you know, sometimes we display innocence like this, but that's also part of social approval. Like when you connect with someone and I think it could very much happen in a social setting to where instead of showing that, like I said, like, Hey, how are you? Like we're connecting. It's, I'm expecting a conversation here, not just a statement, but something back. So it's that same thing. It's social approval. So please, so I say something to you and I look at you like this, like acknowledge what I said, give me that social approval. So I'm still asking for approval in that moment in the form of you, you got to contribute something back. I think there's a lot of merit to that. Awesome. Thank you. I didn't know that. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And now that actually helps me understand why he was doing it the whole trial. Okay, now we're going to jump and take a look at his opening statement. And boy, is there a lot of stuff going on here. So we're going to do this in a couple of small segments, starting with this. Obviously, I don't have any uh, rehearsed or well, well prepared speech. So I'm just going to speak from the heart. Um, I would just like to first say that uh, I want to bring to remembrance something I, I think everyone in this room has been taught uh, pretty much as far back as we can remember is that there's always two sides to every story. Um, and for so long now, uh, roughly a year, there's only truly been one side told of this story. And uh, uh, I've sat back and watched um, from countless narratives that, that, that's that been put out there, um, the way this incident has been portrayed at times, and uh, finally uh, everyone getting a chance to get the full story. Um, you won't hear me try to uh, argue facts. Um, the fact is that this incident was tragic, very tragic. That's not lost on me. There's still a lot of people healing, um, a lot of families healing both sides. Um. There is something I wanted to ask you, Rob, right in the beginning there, uh, as he's starting his opening statement, we're seeing that contempt again. It's flashing. And I'm not sure why, why, like when he's open, when he's starting his own opening statement, why, why am I seeing contempt there? Because again, notice that lip thing. It doesn't always happen. It happens a lot, but it doesn't always, always happen. And here it's happening quite a bit. The one corner of that lip is going up like this with a very contemptuous way of speaking. Why? So what I want to kind of direct your attention to is the layout of the courtroom. Now, when you're watching these videos, and I hope I do this right because I'm on camera, I'm trying to remember which direction I have to look. When he looks directly in front of him, he's looking at the judge. Now, when he looks in this direction. No, the other way. When he looks. Okay. When he looks directly in front of, Let me do this again. 
When he looks directly in front of himself, that's the judge. When he looks in this direction, he is looking to the jury box. The jury box is over in this direction. The witness box is there. Then the judge is right in front of him, and the prosecutor's table is this look. Now, you'll see him do a lot of these looks. Now, I want you to focus on where he's looking when he's giving these expressions. Directly in front, judge. That is towards the witness, so he can see the judge in periphery, jury, and prosecutor. Then there's the jury, in which case he can see the prosecutor in periphery and the judge way peripheral. So keep that in mind when you're watching any of his opening statement. Wow, that makes perfect sense. He starts by saying, obviously. Obviously, I don't have something prepared or written, so I'm going to speak from the heart. And he uses obviously with things that aren't obvious, this being one of them. Why is it obvious that you haven't prepared something? I don't think it's obvious. I didn't know that. Uh, is there any legal reason why that would be obvious, that he hasn't no. prepared something? Right. So he uses this a lot. And again, I'm not going to call him a narcissist because that's a diagnosis. But people with narcissistic behaviors or tendencies will use obviously more often than average because they think that things that are obvious to them are obvious to everyone else. They think that everyone gets what's going on in their head. So that's uh, that was an interesting thing for me. Obviously, I haven't written anything. Really? Is it that obvious? Um, we're going to see a lot of lip activity, not just in this first clip, but in every clip we're going to look at, we're seeing a lot of this, this pursing and grooming, and we even see the tongue inside the mouth doing that kind of thing, and we hear the clicks and pops, and this is very stressful behavior, grooming behavior, when we want to appear better in front of people, we do what's called grooming behaviors, we might adjust our cuffs, adjust our hat, adjust our tie, but we also do things with lip licking or cleaning the teeth like this, or we might, you know, fix things on the face. So he's doing a lot of this. It's for perception. Next, he says, this incident has been portrayed. And as he says portrayed, we see those eyebrows go up. I think it's two things. I think it's emphasis, like this is just a portrayal, not necessarily the truth, but also innocence. The eyebrows go up to say, we're connecting here. There's a different version of this story. I'm innocent. I think it's a mix of those two things. I also do have a problem with him saying that He's not going to argue the truth, but then calling this a uh, portrayal or, or that it's being portrayed. And I know, Rob, that that irritates you as well. You can get to that in just one second because I have one more thing to say. And it's there's healing going on on both sides. Yeah. I'm so sorry that your family is having a hard time with the fact that someone in their family did this horrible, horrifying, unimaginable thing but you cannot compare that. Please don't try to gain sympathy or pity by comparing what your family is going through through what these other families are going through. It is not a fair comparison. He does it more than once. <clears throat> he does it a lot. He does it quite a bit. Yeah. And it's one of the hardest things that I had about watching any of this opening statement, any of his arguments, any of his legal arguments, any of his motions arguments, and his closing statement, every single element of his act in court because I kind of have to call it that um, at some level he truly believes and you can feel it he truly believes that he is equally a victim to every single person who is an actual victim or a family of a victim in that courtroom he believes that the system is victimizing him and if you don't believe that after watching this opening statement and his closing arguments, I don't know what to tell you because it shocked me to watch him say that. And equally shocking was his statement of, I'm not going to argue facts or I'm not here to argue the facts. But then the very next sentence out of his mouth is, but there are two sides to every story. Mr. Brooks, that is, I believe, the very definition of arguing facts and trying to say that you should be viewed as a victim when there were six people that were that lost their lives at your hands behind the wheel of this car and 60 plus others that were injured because of your actions to call it an incident. And to say, I'm not going to argue facts, but there are two sides to this was, um, that was, that was a tough thing to watch. Yeah.
And uh, to add to that, if you're not going to argue facts, why have we seen you question so many witnesses about whether they saw you behind the wheel of that car or how they could be certain that it was you behind the wheel of that car when that's a fact. Nobody's denying that it was you behind that car. The magnitude is something like this and form pains. I think uh, <coughs> it's easy to disregard a lot of a lot of factors. And I think uh, in reference to what I stated earlier, it's, it's easy to forget the other side of the coin. There, there's been a, a lot of suffering involved in this incident, a lot. Obviously, um, with the families, <laughs> with, the, with the community. Even the alleged, the alleged defendant's uh, family as well, there's, there's been a lot of suffering. A lot of misunderstanding. And, uh... Rob, I have a burning question. It's been annoying me so much and it's a term he's used more than once to refer to himself and it's the alleged defendant. What on earth is an alleged defendant? You're not an alleged defendant, you're the defendant. Alleging means you think somebody might have done something, but you're not the alleged defendant. You're the defendant. So what is, why does he keep saying the alleged defendant and referring to himself as the alleged? Because he tries to put himself, oh, <laughs> oh, he tries to put as much distance between he, the person who's sitting in that courtroom, and the defendant that appears on that page. He just refuses to acknowledge that he and this defendant who did these things might be, in fact, the same person. He doesn't admit anything. The alleged, anything that he can do to put a caveat, a space between his name and the actual things that took place, he is going to do. And the worst part about it is he does it not just in the legal context, but he does it in the emotional context. He does it in the factual context. He puts these little caveats between anything. When he's cross-examining witnesses, he says, you know, you know, you, you saw, would it be fair to say you saw we driving the car or you didn't see me driving the car? He tries to put a caveat on everything, to put distance between himself behind the wheel of that car and the actions that took place. It, it, it was disgusting to me from the beginning. And when he does this in this setting, it just, I think it turned off the jurors. I cannot see a single person reacting to it. It just, it bothered me. Now, I had a question for you on this one. Yep. And when I was reviewing it the second time, I'm very curious to hear your response. He talks about the families and he shows what looks to be a remarkably, I mean, I caught that one as being genuine sadness when he's talking about families. But then there was the next sentence and I had a question for you on that one. What's he talking about? And do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, so so it's a great question and it's one that, for me too, it threw me off. when we And we texted, when we saw that opening statement, we texted back and forth going like, okay, now this is different because this entire time he made light of the whole thing, he was joking around, not taking it seriously, being argumentative. 
but we're seeing real stuff here in the facial expressions and yeah we're seeing real sadness so we spoke and then i texted a couple of people that are very much trust in my field so i texted chase hughes who you know we've worked with on the channel one of the best behavior analysts in the world and i texted scott rouse the author of understanding body language one of the best books on body language and the founding member of the behavior panel and i said guys do you think this is real sadness now for me i was seeing real sadness and my note was that it hits the most if we go back and listen it hits the most when he's talking about what his family went through not the victims there are many times where he talks about the victims we don't see this but when he's talking about his family what his family went through now we see it or how he's being portrayed now we see the sadness so that's what i so i asked scott i asked chase and they both agreed that this is sadness for his predicament not what happened to the victims it's not grief it's self-sadness with sadness typically we see those eyes and that's this is something that's really hard to fake this is the reason i would be very remiss to say that's fake it's very hard to bring just the inner corners of your eyebrows up and together like this to do this without the fingers obviously happens in sadness this is again paul ekman who noticed that that happens in sadness and droopiness in the face as well and we're seeing here a bit of droopiness in the mouth droopiness in the eyes we're definitely seeing that as well so this is something that's really hard to fake and happens in sadness and those lines we see up here also happen when those eyebrows go up and we're seeing all of those things but the source of it is himself and the sadness that his family is going through i just want you to keep in mind uh everything that will be uh, presented in its totality to keep in mind. The power that you have. I believe uh, that should escape your, your knowledge. All right, guys. So I have a big surprise for all of you, including Rob right now, because here's the thing. We all know Rob as a lawyer, a YouTuber, a carpenter, and he's great at all these things. But there's something else that Rob is really good at but you even he doesn't know that he's really good at this thing and rob is actually a world-class mentalist and he doesn't even know it yet and rob you have no idea what i'm about to do right you you don't know i didn't talk about this with you no not a clue <laughs> okay. i'm gonna prove to the world that rob is a world-class mentalist right now and i'm gonna walk you through this because i've been a mentalist for over <laughs> 10 years i know exactly how this works i'm gonna walk you through this okay so okay. rob the mentalist ladies and gentlemen i have an envelope over here and in this envelope i've written down something that i'm thinking now you're the mentalist in this rob you're going to i'm going to walk you through this you're going to focus and you're going to tell everyone what i've written down on this envelope and i'm, I'm going to walk you through this so while we're watching that clip he was speaking this way and then he looked at the jury and he said he made a reference about the power that they have the power that they have and in that moment we saw the emotion spike the sadness really spiked as he looked at them and said the power that they have i believe that when he looked at them he saw something he looked at the jury i believe he saw something very specific i don't want to give any more clues so rob here's how mentalists operate you're going to close your eyes and you're going to like theatrically make it seem like you're really focusing on something when in fact we all know that you're using tricks and body language and psychology and you're going to tell me what i think he saw when he looked over to the jury the my thought which is inside this envelope you as the mentalist you're going to read my mind and tell us all what did he see when he looked at that jury you mean when he's looking at the jury yep. imploring and and giving all of his heartfelt speech mm -hmm. and we see that sadness spike what did he see when he looked at the jury i've i'm i'm getting uh <laughs> I'm getting a lot of, I'm not getting anything. Did he, I, I don't think he saw anything. 
Oh my God, look at you how theatric you are to make it to tie it into you not getting anything because that is exactly Perfect. what it is. Nothing. Nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Robdini, the amazing psychic mentalist. That's Spidey exactly not, right. Spidey and I will be touring. We'll be touring uh, late 2023. Uh, look for the banners as they come out. Uh, tickets Two will be... Mentals Mact. However many dollars we can charge. <laughs> um, men mental Lumber will be the name of the act. <laughs> mental Lumber. Okay, got it. That works. No problem. <laughs> Amazing Mental Lumbers. <laughs> I think that at that moment when he looked over to the jury, um, he saw nothing. Because he's talking about the power that they have. And at that moment, he realizes that it hits him. That they have the power to lock him up for life. And I think as he looks at them, he sees nothing. And that's why we said sadness spike. Here's a fun part that I get to play a trick back on you because you have no idea that I'm going to bring this up right now in this video. He made the comment of you have the power to the jury. Yeah. Now, I've watched something that you haven't watched. Ooh. And it's a lot of the closing argument in this particular case. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't because we're filming... We're filming right after that, and I just I didn't have a chance to see it yet. You're right. Yep. So the power that he's alluding to and why he had this panic moment is the power that the jury has to nullify the law and jury nullification. So laying a little bit of background, jury nullification is when something is quite literally by letter of the law illegal and wrongful. If the issue is put to the jury, the jury finds that the person was righteous in their behavior but would otherwise have conducted an unlawful act, the jury can, quote, nullify the law and acquit the person even though they were, by definition of law, wrongful. Now, when he says power in his opening statement referring to the jury and he sees nothing in response, that then gives you the exact understanding of why he had the emotional breakdown he did, because he knew he was going to argue that the jury should engage in jury nullification and Almost. didn't see Jack coming back. Wow. Wow. When it's time for you to make your decision, all of you, I believe that And I pray that it's the right decision. <laughs> All right, so here we're seeing another spike in that sadness. And it's when he says, uh, I believe and I pray that it's the right decision. He looks at them and then we see that sadness hit him big time again with those eyebrows. And uh, I simply think it's because at his core, he knows that to any outsider looking at this case, the right decision would be to put him away. I, and I think that's what, that's, that emotion that's hitting him in that moment is the realization that the right decision isn't in his best interest at all. And up until yesterday, I would have disagreed with you because I felt it a different way. I thought he was talking about his right decision. But watching today and watching his reaction when he was ultimately convicted by the jury of these acts... A lot of people predicted that there would be some immense explosion or expression of sadness or some massive visceral reaction he would have to it, but nothing. There was nothing. There was, a, there was a dropping of the head. There was a looking at a book without turning pages, but there was no open expression of sadness or any surprise. So I think that you, there's a lot to be said about that analysis. Maybe you were right from the very beginning. It's weird. I think there's even within himself a contrast where half of him goes... Um, everyone's always, you know, everyone's always picking on me and, uh, you know, I don't know why because I'm not a bad person, but at the same time, there's that expectancy that people will pick on him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Like there's on one hand, he's like, everyone's unfair. Everyone picks on me, but that plays into the narrative that this jury's going to put him away because everyone always picks on me. So that balance kind of makes it seem like he thinks he might think there's nothing wrong with him. He did nothing wrong but he's used to others picking on him and always seeing him as being the bad guy. So I think in that moment he looks over and he goes, they're gonna see the right thing as being putting me away. Just another bunch of people who wanna make me look like the bad guy. And that's why he didn't react. 
when the verdict came in. To me, it just confirmed to him that everyone's against him. There's been a lot of words thrown out there about the alleged. A lot of speculation, a lot of ridicule. Words like demon. Words like monster. He just, every, every word that he says in that entire bit, every part of that, he's speaking about the alleged as if it's this hypothetical thing. But then the emotional reaction you see is an emotional response that's a real response. That is real sadness. Everything that Spidey has taught you about sadness, put that to test here. That's real sadness. But the sadness is towards the words that people are saying about him as a person accusing him of being evil or being a demon. And he doesn't view himself that way and he can't stomach that other people do. So he is expressing this ultimately truthful and honest expression of sadness, but it's because people view him as a monster. Mr. Brooks, admit that what you did was wrong and then ask for forgiveness. Gosh, you're going about this the wrong way. Sorry, that was a little bit of a vent fest, vent no, fest, but I needed it. Totally understandable, man. And again, when he says uh, monster or demon, the eyebrows go up as he says that, a demon. And again, when do we see those eyebrows go up? Very commonly, and I think in this case, surprise and innocence for social approval, for social connection. But you're not innocent. And why are you surprised? It's like he's shocked by these words. But... Can you just for one second put yourself in the shoes of someone reading this on the news that someone did this? Wouldn't you agree that someone who does something like that is a demon, a monster? Like, why are you so shocked and surprised by these terms given what you did? It's almost like he's unaware of what he did. Ultimately, I think if he had the opportunity to make the argument he wanted to make based on my view of his examination of his ex-girlfriend, of the arguments he tried to make when he was trying to put her on the stand, I think that in his mind, he was not present there. How he viewed the case was that he and his girlfriend got into an altercation and he went off of the emotional deep end to such an extent where he was not in control. I'm not talking about physical control or logical control. I'm talking about emotional control. He lost all emotional control and ended up in a situation that he was incapable of handling in that moment. And rather than stop the vehicle, he just kept going because he had lost everything. He was emotionally not present. Now, that is not an excuse that's recognized in the law for your behavior and tactics, which is why he wasn't allowed to present that argument. But what you're seeing when he gives this opening statement and when you see a bit of his argument is you kind of get a glimpse into how he might be viewing this from an internal level. And that's just my two cents. It might not mean anything, but it might mean something. I think you're right. Um, very much so. And had his point been, I did a monstrous thing, but I'm not a monster. It's different than saying that the alleged is being called a lot of names like a monster. Correct. You might not have had the intent to do it. And that would have been the defense that you would have made. But you can't say I didn't have the intent to do it while you're saying it wasn't me that did it. That doesn't, those two don't align. All right, there it was. I mean, this is a crazy case where you can go to any moment in this and it's just gonna be amazing stuff to look at behaviorally, legally. Uh, and Rob, I wanna thank you enormously for your time here and your value, as always, such valuable input, both in the legal sense and your understanding of human behavior always amazes me. So I wanna thank you so much for being here, Rob. It was an absolute blast. Well, and Spidey, let me, let me just echo that right back. Like uh, having, Having you both as a friend and a resource that I get to talk to on a regular basis when stuff like this pops up during the week and I get to text you and and have that back and forth dialogue of am I crazy here or am I right in what I'm seeing? 
Um, and then to be able to take that content in something that's digestible, digestible in multiple formats and, and to multiple audiences is something that's really fun. So thank you very much for giving me that chance. Of course, man. It's, it's a highlight of my week when you text me and you're just panicking and, I, and I'm there with you. Like sometimes it's like, oh my God, did you see opening statement? Oh my God, yes. And like, we're like, ah, and like just, <laughs> ah. so yeah, dude, always, always a pleasure. And I look forward to the next one. Yep. Until then. Well, there you have it, folks. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for watching to the end of this video. Now, if you wouldn't mind doing some of the YouTube things such as like and subscribe, it really does mean a lot to us. Also, be sure to check out the content over on Spidey's channel. It is not to be missed. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed the content and I'll see you later.